story. I'm so happy that you all joined in today again to listen to another broadcast from What's Your Story. I love doing the show. It's my passion and I love being able to interview people from really around the world because I'm based in Thailand and people that I interview right now are mostly from the United States. They all have a story. It's a unique story. They share their ups and downs and all arounds. But let's make something clear. There's no judgment here. And I really want to hit home with that because it's not up to us to say what someone should or shouldn't have done. Just this is about everyone's story. So today I, let me see here one moment. I'm going to turn this off for you. One second here. Thank you for being patient. And there we go. Okay. So today I have a guest and her name is Dr. Annie Bacon. She has the same last name as I do. I wonder why. Well, that's because we are related. She is my by marriage nephew's wife. She's a wonderful woman and she is an optometrist. Dr. Annie Bacon is a lifelong Oregonian, so she's from Oregon, who has been a providing eye care and eyewear service throughout Portland for nearly a decade. Dr. Annie is vibrantly active in the community. She's worked extensively with organizations supporting our community's most vulnerable citizens, traveling and volunteering with the Seba Foundation throughout Cambodia was a life-changing experience. She grew up in Beaverton. She graduated from the University of Oregon with a Bachelor's of Science and earned her Doctorate of Optometry from New England College of Optometry in Boston. Upon graduation, she recognized and awarded the Practice Management Award of Excellence. After being wooed into returning to Portland, Dr. Annie married her college sweetheart in 2011 at Lansu Chinese Garden in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Annie's personalized approach allows her to develop long-term relationships with her patients, and she is grateful for the opportunity to provide optometry services to her friends and neighbors in the Portland community. Dr. Annie Bacon is passionately active and cares deeply for her community. She's chaired the Junior League of Portland. She has uh, been part of Stop Human Trafficking Committee. She has done so many things in her community, and I have posted all of those on my, on my website, www.kathybacon.com. So you can go there, you can read all of her uh, accolades, believe me, and you can find ways to get a hold of her on my website. So, but one more thing I want you to know that really struck me and made me feel very good inside is the mission of the eyewear department. And that is practice with purpose, locally and globally. So I am so glad that you all get to meet my relative and learn about optometry today. So there she is. Hi, Annie. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. I'm so excited to have you and see you. And it's just always amazing about the internet that you are in Portland, Oregon, in the United States, and I'm in Thailand. And here we are getting to share some time together and talk about what you do, which, by the way, is pretty amazing. And as you can see, Dr. Annie is still in her office. So she's a dedicated doctor for sure. <laughs> So tell us what and why did you become an optometrist? So my initial interest in optometry and just the eye health profession started when I was a kid. My parents are originally from Thailand. And so yes. I was born and raised in Portland, though, obviously you just said that. So we would go back to visit every few years 
my grandparents. And my grandmother, each year, she slowly started losing her vision. And I remember as a kid asking family, you know, why, what's going on with our grandmother? Why is she going blind? And at the oh. time, they pretty much just said, oh, it's just part of getting old. That's just what happens. And it wasn't really until I was a little bit older, my sister and I were talking, because she's also in the healthcare profession, but we realized she probably just had cataracts. And the sad thing about cataracts is that it's completely fixable and treatable with just a simple surgery like cataract surgery. Um, And it is one of the leading causes of blindness. And I I don't think the family, I think they just didn't realize it. It was just simply they had no idea that it probably was cataracts. So that really was my first... um, thought of like well that's silly that could have been fixed well, why did they not know about it and that was, that was my initial right. interest in optometry um mm-hmm. i mean the the bonus about optometry and just uh, the optical world is it also kind of combines the medical device part of allowing someone to see clearly with glasses and contacts but also the fashion aspect um so yeah. that's the fun part because you can also get someone to see well and make them feel really confident and and, and pretty in what they're in what they're accessorizing with so yeah that was kind of well, glasses have come a long way haven't they I mean I love yes, my glasses have. now <gasps> when I was younger I couldn't yep. stand wearing my glasses yep. I would hide them in my purse everything else but now they're so stylish you know <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. so and your grandma was did someone finally have a look since you realized it or was it kind of like okay grandma I mean we've learned from grandma the fight, the fight. Right. So by the time we realized it, it was really in high school and they had already passed away by middle school. She had already passed away by middle school. But was, um, okay. but thinking about it, it was, so she was mainly upstairs in the house and there was a big balcony, but um, because she really couldn't see, my aunts or uncles yeah. would have to just kind of walk her to outside to let her go outside, carry her down down the stairs. And so it was one of those things where um, obviously if we had, it had realized it at the time, we would have said something, but I of it was course. just we too young at the moment. Yeah. Of course, of course. So, you know you would have yeah. done something about it. Of course you guys would have. Um, but it was it's interesting to hear you say that later in life, when you started going to school and college, that you thought about it. Mm-hmm. And it became something that you became very interested in so that you could help other people, you know, mm-hmm. with their eye care because it is a big deal. I mean, eye care is not just mm-hmm. something people kind of take it for granted, I think, sometimes. It's something you should never take for granted. <laughs> it's I mean, interesting, be, right? Because I think I I believe, like I've read something where they say the um, number one fear people have is going blind. Yet, right. people do take it for granted, not realizing that a lot of the different types of um, disease that can occur, it, at least visually related, typically is painless. So you really wouldn't know if something was going on unless you went in on a more annual basis to make sure the baseline, everything's okay, and then ensure it right. remains healthy. So, but you're right, yeah. Wow. So there's so much competition now too with optometrists. Like there's franchises, you know, you've got that um, department in a hospital, why did you decide to open the eye department aside so, from these you know, other options? Right. So I, I think a lot of the commercial places, online retailers, all of that has, it's not new. It's been around for years, even probably a decade. Um, what I wanted to do was really provide my patients with a different type of standard of care, the kind of care that I would want. I care more about establishing a relationship and getting to know an individual find out what their problems are and see how I can help fix that or find solutions for them. And I right. don't feel in my opinion that I would have been able to do that in a different setting. Um, making, you know, deciding to open eye department in Portland was also um, a very well thought out plan to choose Southwest Portland. Cause we're kind of, we're downtown, but we're kind of on the outskirt a little bit of downtown. Right. And I really wanted like a neighborhood feel a family practice um Mm -hmm. and i feel like we kind of have that now in this little tiny area of of, of southwest so it's been really fun to see the community grow and have our patient pace grow also from like little kids to yeah families visiting from out of town yeah and you know that's the thing too is you know for me if i can go to a smaller place and get care that's what i'd rather do than a big hospital the franchises i don't really nothing against them i just don't mm-hmm. 
think I'm going to get the best care there because I'm just like another number in there. But if I go to see Annie Bacon, I'm going to have a conversation. She's going to, you know, take care of me in a, in a number of different ways besides my eyes, which is like you said, making you feel comfortable coming in and sharing with you what they need. So, you know, what's and your, what was your big, you. yeah. Oh, sorry. I agree with you on that. Um, I, I, I think franchise, hospital setting, all of them are great. It just, it's, it's yes. just, it wasn't best suited for me. And I've worked all of them already. So that's yeah. why I knew for me, I wanted a very specific practice where I could practice how I would like and um, right. provide what I feel confidently the care that people deserve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's personal too. I mean, you wear glasses. Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. not just somebody that, you know, doesn't wear glasses and, Decides people's needs. Yeah. I mean, you're basing it off of what you need and what you right. want, and that's what you portray back onto your patients. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's, I think it's really important in any business. But when you guys started, what was your biggest hurdle? You know, kind of getting in this niche in in yeah. Portland. Yeah. I think I think the biggest hurdle is starting a practice from the ground up that's always a hard one um especially in the industry where typically you you know you have an exam once a year or so it's building that initial patient base and yeah. um being patient enough to know it will grow um it will just take time um to right. see that patient base grow and the right marketing and just getting out to the community has been like the key yeah yeah i think so too i mean it, it any business it doesn't matter if it's an eye department or any business, I mean, it takes time to grow. And mm -hmm. people want to, people, they want things to be foolproof a little bit. So mm -hmm. now we have the ability to go online and write, you know, reviews about places we've been. So, I mean, mm -hmm. we look at those all the time in Thailand. I mean, we really do. Yeah. We look at them all the time. Who's been there? What's the review? So just mm -hmm. building up that social aspect of it too is now come into businesses which was different in the past but it's almost definitely definitely a big deal now <laughs> it is and it's hard because it for me I, I don't it's not something you learn in optometry school to ask people to write a review about how you provided no. them care so it's always kind of like a little bit outside my comfort zone but in the industry now or in the world we live in it is a pretty vital component is the online reviews right. or just um that referral base so that's been also right. a big learning curve for me personally, but yeah, yeah, I, I know it was, it was for me when I started trying to promote the show and um, just the different opportunities I had to get the word out there. Um, it wasn't like that years ago. So in so many ways, businesses are lucky in that respect, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I know that I know this whole eye department is a dream come true, really for you and what was the biggest learning curve for you kind of getting into this business, opening it up? I mean, your husband works there, you have two other employees looking for another employee. So how, how about that? Tell us a little bit about that with the business. I think because my husband is my business partner and obviously my husband, so I'm with him quite a bit. The biggest yes learning curve is maintaining that work-life balance because right. we could sit and talk business nonstop but you got to balance right. that out and have kind of that free time to realize you know yeah. there's more to life than just how to grow a department it'll come and so yes. that was probably the biggest learning curve because um and we're both involved in a lot of different organizations like you had mentioned yes, you I, uh, I really I care a lot about the community and I have been for the past six years involved with Cure League of Portland um, which focuses mainly on domestic violence against women and children. And so that was um, a hard balance, especially when we first started opening the practice and being involved with Tierney League. So I had to step back a little bit. But now that I department has grown, I'm able to kind of get back into some of the community outreach that I also wanted to, to be part of. So, but it was hard. Yeah, so, yeah but, and you've also gone overseas and mm -hmm. into Cambodia and did some yep. eye. Yep. Things. And, and that was very rewarding, right? It was by far, was by far probably the most rewarding experience I've ever had. Um, so we went with Save a Foundation, which is based in California, and they provide eye care um, and eyewear to those in need, specifically communities and other countries that are in need. This 
trip in particular to Cambodia was um, strictly about cataract surgery. Okay. So um, when we went, we were doing a lot of post, like pre and post op cataract surgery. And um, it sounds so silly to say that I feel like I got more out of it than the individuals that had the cataract yeah, surgery. Because it was, no, it was I an agree. amazing experience. Mm. Um, I think the surgeons did over 500 cataract surgeries in the span wow. of like seven or eight days. Um, I don't know if you're like familiar with the process. I'll just do a little summary about it. But Please. they would go in, people would, um, Seva goes out and actually goes to the neighboring villages, door to door, knocking on the doors, asking mm. if anyone is having trouble seeing. Um, and this is what I wish my grandmother had had in Thailand, actually. Yeah, so a lot of absolutely. people think this is part of the age thing. And so when right. someone would say, yes, my mom or my sister or I have an issue, they would bring them out, do the screening, provide the transportation for them to get to the makeshift oh, hospital, um, so go through nice. a day to two days of the surgery. And then when you first have the surgery, you wear a little medical eye patch. And then the, um, the, second, the second day after surgery, you're able to take that patch off and people are able to see again. Um, so it was amazing to see people who have been blind for like 10, 15 years. Oh and what's crazy is the first thing a lot of the women looked at were their hands. Because the oh. last time they saw their hands was literally 10, 15 years ago. So they're like, oh my gosh, I look so old is what they say. And But they're so happy they can see or see their mm -hmm. grandchildren. And so it really was um, – that's what I mean by I think. I feel like my husband and I got more out of it than they did. Yeah. It was really amazing to have that experience. And, mm -hmm. and really that's how we came up with our um, mission statement was when we were in Cambodia um, to right. practice the purpose uh, locally and globally. So it was um, something I definitely great. would like to do again. It's, oh, and you're right about that. Anytime, anytime I've had the opportunity to give, I don't, it, it becomes this, your heart just swells up because you seem like you get so much more out of it, like you said, than the mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 not true. It, it's they're getting it too, but you're getting it because oh my gosh, this is coming from somewhere else, yep. <laughs> deep inside. And mm -hmm. to have that experience is is mm -hmm. things that we mm -hmm. need to. I wish everybody could have that experience because then we don't ever yeah. we don't ever stop giving at, when we have it. We just there's right. we find ways right. to give back. And, and that's, yeah. that's really an awesome thing. And which leads me to, which I love about your practice, because I read a lot about it on your website, is the iHeart program. And can you tell us a little bit about that? It's a iHeart Baby program that you have mm -hmm. at your practice. Yeah. So the iHeart Baby program is, um, it was developed initially because I actually had met a senior in high school who came in for an exam and he um, had really poor vision. And throughout the exam, he was telling me how his, when he was a kid, he always really wanted to go to law school and become an attorney. Because school was so difficult, he was like, I'm just not gonna do college or law school, I'm just gonna go straight into the workforce, which again is completely fine. But yeah. hearing him say that and realizing that if he had just had an exam at a younger age, had his a pair of glasses or contacts, his yeah. school would have been significantly more easy yeah. he would have been able to like not struggle likely as much especially when I think it was close to 80 percent of learning is done visually and so that like really yes. bothered me when I when he told me this so I told him like, you can get glasses it's okay you could still do law school but he was very sad I'm like I'm done and I was talking to my husband Brian and he had said well what can you do is there something you can do to prevent that and that's when I heart baby kind of developed was mm. to be able to just catch something early on, even at that young of age at six months to a year, and then keep right. seeing that person, you know, four, six years old and, and ensure that everything is developing correctly. Um, right. So yeah, yeah I fun. see. I see on your on your website this little guy and you you've got the whole headgear on and you're just yeah. zooming right into him and he's just looking at you like where did you come from? <laughs> you know? But yeah. he's just sitting there yeah. mesmerized. Yeah, and baby exams, I swear on, I become like an acrobat where I've got them, I'm on the ground, I'm running around wherever they are, I need to move to where they're at versus forcing them. You can't force a baby to stay still or to look at the right spot. So um, yeah. it's been fun. Oh. It's been a really fun experience for that. Yeah. I think that's and I think it's so great too. Yeah. Um, it gives a lot of, I think, first time parents a little bit of peace of mind. They're so stressed out. Like a lot of my friends at the time when we started I Heart Baby, um, a lot of my friends were starting families and so they had so much 
stress in their life about what's going on with my baby. And it was just one more thing that either it's peace of mind or we come up with a solution to help the baby develop their visual system as it's supposed to. So. Well, it seems, it seems right. I mean, when my kids were younger, nobody ever said, take him to the doc, to the eye doctor. Mm -hmm. Nope. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was wellness exams for your baby to check their heart yeah. and their weight and all that, but no one ever checked their eyes. I mean, when you, when I look at it now, I think it, that's kind of crazy. No one checked their eyes. Right. Right. And you're, you're, you know, so many kids and, you know, I taught in schools for a long time and, and so many kids have issues that they think are just normal and they don't say anything about them. Yeah. You know, like, well, don't I don't know. see very they don't, they don't, well. Right. They have nothing to compare it to. So they have no idea. Right. And what I think right. is always the hardest part with kids is you do school screening. Yes, there's school yes. screenings. But right. sometimes if there's one eye that's not seen quite as well, kids will be able to kind of maneuver a little bit around that. So they have one eye that develops really well and the other eye that's not seen quite as well. And that's still going to be a struggle learning. Right. And so I think... Right. Um, Screenings are awesome and it's great, but I, I do think having a little bit more of a baseline for kiddos is, is well worth it. Right, right. Oh, I've got something on the Facebook page. Someone's saying something. Oh, Dr. Annie is fabulous. And that is from oh. Abby McNeil. Oh, Abby, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> She's, you're fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have a, a, a gentleman that is always following and he's such a, he's got a great nonprofit and his name's Ben and Ben says, hi, Kathy and Dr. Ann. So there are people out there watching and looking and, and I hope that they get to see your interview at some point on your website or even on your page because um, um, your information is really uh, something that we all need to hear. What patient lifestyle activities, and this is something I really want to know myself, have the most effects on vision and are they preventative measures that people can take? You know, somebody that works out a lot or maybe is out in the air all the time, like here now with the smoke, I feel like my mm -hmm. eyes are burning and I don't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of um, lifestyle, you know, I think people forget that eyes are organs. So really, right. what, if you're practicing a poor lifestyle, if you're a smoke in a pack a day, if you've got high blood pressure, diabetes, um, right. likely your vision is going to be affected. So really just coming down to the core of living a really healthy lifestyle. You know, yeah. a lot of um, a lot of signs of undiagnosed high blood pressure or diabetes can be seen in an eye exam. So that's why it's so important to remember that what you put in your body is going to affect all of those right. organs. And so it's, it's really just maintaining a healthy lifestyle by avoid smoking exercise, you know, mm -hmm. wear UV protection, wear sunglasses, because that will prevent cataracts, you know? Um, right. It's just reminding yourself that your whole, it's all connected. Your whole body mm -hmm. is connected, so including yeah. your eyes. And you don't think, I don't really think of that until you say it, mm -hmm. and then I'm like, well, mm -hmm. of course they are. They're our eyes. Yeah. I mean, we see with them. So, yeah. you know, yeah. how do you feel about, like, when eyes are burning or eyes are, you know, like, when you have tired eyes, do you believe in putting in those drops? I mean, there's so many different kinds of drops. I mean, that drives me a little crazy. Yes, yes. there are. And it really comes down to what's causing the burning and what's uh, causing the irritation, right. you know, because there's obviously, and you're right, there's so many drops out on the market right now. There's yes. some that I probably would tell patients, no, I don't think you should do this. And I have told patients that. And then, um, and others that I do recommend. I think right. it's everything's in moderation. You know, artificial okay. tears are great dependent on what you're needing them for. Obviously, if you're doing artificial tears one drop an hour, probably too much, you know, because you want to be able to have right. your eyes produce a normal amount too versus having additional um, lubrication. So right. it is hard, but it kind of comes down to what could be causing the burning, whether right. it's allergies, dryness, right. Um, right. Eye you know, there's just so many different things it could potentially be. Yeah, and we go ahead and medicate ourselves, not really knowing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of crazy. So I just haven't put anything in my eyes, even though they were burning. I'm like, there's so many different things, and I just, I don't know. I just don't like to take chances myself. I just, mm -hmm. like you said, eat healthy, live healthy, you know, exercise. And I have to ask a question because I've always wanted to ask this question to an optometrist, and I felt silly, but I don't feel silly with you. Okay. Is it really? Is it really true? that if you eat carrots, that carrots 
help eyesight. Baby carrots <laughs> oh, are really that a myth? Carrots are healthy. <laughs> I don't, it's not a myth, but it's not necessarily a, oh my gosh, you eat so many carrots and you're, you're never going to eat glasses. You know, there's a lot of other components to vision, including, you know, right. obviously if your parents wear glasses, but um, vegetables are really good for your eyes. So in yeah. this case, if people are listening, I'd say, yes, eat carrots, eat spinach, <laughs> yes. eat high antioxidant diet, you know, eat fish, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, and when I when got older, I'm thinking, did they just tell me that because they wanted me to eat carrots or does it really help because I'm wearing glasses now? Yeah. Does it only help during a certain? (laughs) Does it only help during a certain time? (laughs) I'm so glad we had this conversation, Annie. (laughs) Oh gosh, so glad. It's been a burning question in my mind for years and years and years. Um, Can you can you give the audience a little bit of information about? their vision and how daily activities impact their vision. You know, what are some ways that they can, you know, do some healthy eye preventative care? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in in our society right now where there's electronic devices everywhere, you know, there's iPads, there's e-readers, there's computer, there's electronic billboards. I think our world is pretty much in front of us at this point in devices. And I think it's really important to try to realize when you're looking at one, what I call focal points, if you're reading a book or look at your computer, it's not natural for your eyes to be fixating at one spot for hours on it. You know, your eyes want it. They're like muscles and you need to be able to focus in different areas. So I usually like to tell my patients um, the 20-20-20 rule. So every 20 minutes, if you're sitting at a computer, look at something a good 20 feet away and focus on it for at least 20 seconds. Just so that way you're not um, fixating all only on your computer Mm. or on Netflix or whatever it is you're looking at. You know, it's very important to um, give your eyes a rest. You don't want to overwork the eyes or overstrain. Just like muscles in your body. You don't want to exercise. You need to stretch. You need to um, give your eyes a break. Well, and also, if I'm on the computer for a long time, my eyes bug me. But then not only that, but then that leads to a headache. And yeah. then, yeah. so it just, it kind of, you know, it does a little bit of a different effect then from your eyes to your head. And then, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I I really try, when I was first here, I was working a lot on the computer and I my eyes were always strained and I always had a headache. And I'm thinking, what is wrong? Well, maybe you should get off your computer for five minutes and walk around. Like you said, yeah. just get up and move around yeah. a little bit and not yeah. be yeah. so focused and centered on that computer because we all are there, like you said right now. This is that the world. I mean, if you're not on your phone, if you're not on your phone, you're on your computer. If you're not on your computer and your iPad, I mean, it's one thing after another. So we're constantly using our eyes now. Whereas before, mm-hmm. it really wasn't like that, but it is now. Nope. So it is now. Uh, eye care is very important. And I have to mm-hmm. tell you, Dr. Annie Bacon, I'm really glad that you're out there in the world doing what you do. I must say. (laughs) So um, is there any advice that you would give to my audience about what they can do on a daily basis to do their eyes, which you said, computer, you know, really take care of your eyes. What about going, how often do you need to go in for a checkup? to have your eye vision done and all that. Is that once a year, once every other year? How does that work? I think once a year is what I typically recommend. Once a year is what I recommend. It's just you kind of get that baseline. You make sure everything's nice and healthy. Um, I think two years is dependent on, it's just too long to wait at times. I mean, two years is obviously better than four years. You know, so usually I tell people once a year is what's recommended. Um, Right. Hopefully everything will stay nice and stable. But going longer than that, it's just not worth it. Your vision's just too important to right. to not go once a year. Just like I normally go once a year routine checkup to my primary care doctor, even though I'm relatively healthy and will be probably right. told I'm still relatively healthy. Same idea. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, we just just taking care of everything uh, from the ground up. Of mm-hmm. course, it's going to affect your eyes. It's not, I mean, you can't just, like you said, smoking. I mean, if you're smoking, that's not very good either because the smoke is going in your eyes. Uh, exactly. if, you live in a, yep. if you live in an area where there's a lot of pollution, then again, your eyes are being affected. So you really have to, I mean, I think 
I go once a year and now I'm due to go again. I didn't go here in Thailand, but I'm due to go again. So I might have to wait till I get to Portland. <laughs> you, you should come. Yes. Come maybe this summer sometime. Yeah. I know. I know because I need new glasses and I, I can tell that my glasses are getting weaker and I'm getting older. So again, too, Annie, you know, people that are getting older have run a chance more of getting glaucoma as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's predominantly because glaucoma is a very slow disease. So that's why generally okay. it's, it, it's diagnosed later in life. But you're, but you're correct in that you can catch it earlier, but if you're not mm -hmm. going in on an annual basis or seeing that same person on an annual basis, it's harder to catch because you don't see the progression. Um, so that's why also I feel like it's very important for the annual exam to check pressures right. to make sure that the, the, the retina is healthy, the optic nerve is healthy, just to right. ensure that there's no signs of glaucoma or macular degeneration or any of the right. um, slow right. disease that can occur. Yeah. Well, you know, before we go, is there any advice that you can provide for the audience or is there any parting words that you'd like to say to everyone about about you know taking care of your eyes because um it, it it's it's very important <laughs> mm -hmm. for those of you that don't think it's not a big deal that you need to check out your body and maybe not your eyes uh that's a little bit wrong <laughs> yeah. we know I that. Mean, that, would, that would yeah i mean that would probably be my parting words is it, it really generally I exams are about 45 minutes of your time it won't take very long but it's really important to make sure everything is staying nice and healthy if you want to maintain good vision right right it's just it's just well worth it especially with all of the electronic devices out there at this point um there's so many different small aids you can get when it comes to low prescriptions to help with computers mm -hmm. to prevent any eye fatigue um of course I'd love to have patients come but I, I care more about just be seen you don't have to come back from just be seen. Make sure your eyes are healthy. Um, that's the takeaway. It's, vision is too important. Yeah, it it's is too, too important. important. Take it for granted. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And if you are in Portland area, which I know we have some people that always uh, watch from Portland, you might want to go see Dr. Annie and tell us the best ways that someone can get a hold of you. I know what I love on your website is that you can actually schedule your own appointment, mm -hmm. which is yep, very cool go, for people. So give us yep. that uh, web address. It is www.idepartment.com. Super okay. easy. You can go Super right easy. on there and schedule online. You can also call if you'd like our phone numbers on there, which is 503-227-0573. Um, we try to make it as simple as possible. Yeah, you do. You make it simple as possible. And your website, her, her website is very comprehensive. If you have any questions, I will doubt that you will after you uh, look at the website, because everything that you need is on there uh, about Annie, about her whole uh, team. Her, th that information is on there. The um, like you said, you can go ahead and schedule your appointment there. So you make it so easy for us. So I don't think there's a reason <laughs> that we shouldn't be checking out our eyes. <laughs> That's what I think, Annie. And it's such, such a pleasure talking to you and hearing about your experiences and about how you got into being a doctor of optometry. I, I didn't know those things. So I'm all better in the know today. And I look so forward to seeing you in the summer because in fact, we are going back to the Washington, Oregon, uh, area for uh, to see our family members. So I, I'm really looking forward to spending some time with you and Brian and Sandy and Jonathan and his new wife's name is Mejo, Mejo? Maria Jose. Maria Jose. Okay, I always see that on Facebook. So I'm because she has so, that, yeah, that's what she has her name as. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really just honored to have you here and thank you so much for taking the time because I know that you're hours along and you're very busy. So I appreciate your time and effort of, of being here today. I really, really do. So it was my thank pleasure. You. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this. This has been a really great experience and I'm really excited to see you and Andy this coming yeah, up. Yeah, so. I am too. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. And thank you all from the bottom of my heart for coming on and watching What's Your Story and listening to the amazing stories of all my guests and, um, this is What's Your Story. So everyone, have a great evening, a great day. 
whatever it is for you in whatever part of the world. Goodbye. Bye.